Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Nasiri, and each week I meet with military veterans to learn what they do in their civilian career, how they got there, and advice for other veterans seeking to do the same. Today's episode number 198 with Benjamin Faw. For almost every, I think every single successful entrepreneur, at least that I've known, on some level or another, and maybe almost every level, they're just learning machines and growth machines. And so it's to me less or so a certain book or podcast or conference as much as it is like if you're not trying to learn and better yourself every single day, then maybe this isn't where you need to be. Today's episode is great for those of you interested in entrepreneurship, in technology, or just looking to be the best in whatever career you choose. Ben is a great guy. He's got a fantastic perspective on starting a company and the pros and cons of taking that approach. As always at beyondtheuniform.io, you'll find show notes with everything we discuss. You'll also find other great episodes, over nearly 200 of them now, as well as links for our coaching program, Audible's offer for a free audiobook, of your choice and much more. So with that, let's dive in to my Inver conversation with Ben Faw. Joining me today in San Francisco, California is Benjamin Faw. Ben, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Thanks, Justin. It's a delight to be here. So wanted to give listeners a quick background. Uh, ben is the co-founder and chief operating officer of Best Reviews, a technology startup that has helped over 180 million users by simplifying their purchasing decisions. Best Reviews was recently acquired by Tronk, formerly known as Tribune Publishing, for $110 million. He started out at West Point and served in the U.S. Army for four and a half years as a platoon leader, executive officer, and aide-de-camp. After his military service, he got his MBA from Harvard Business School and worked at LinkedIn as a marketing solutions account executive. And and just quick aside, for those of you who listened, I uh, published a uh, panel I was on at Service to Schools Summit a few weeks ago, and you probably, if you listened to that, you heard Benjamin's advice as we were talking about MBAs, but I met him there and uh, was excited to have him on the show because he's got a really interesting background. Um, so Ben, maybe to start things off, um, if someone's on active duty, how would you explain to them what best reviews is? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, Justin, because I think there's a need for this for some active duty service members and not necessarily a, a familiar one-stop shop, less the one that some of us grew up with in print, which... Um, you might be familiar with is Consumer Reports. It was kind of this print publication, a magazine that, that I grew up around and I think other some other service members did as well that was effectively a place you would go that would have advice, recommendations, insight, and research on most products in and around your house to include cars. And what we've tried to do with Best Reviews is reimagine that in a for-profit business model where Consumer Reports is a not-for-profit and in a digital first, digital native environment versus the kind of print first where consumer reports has originated. And, and that's what we are. We're a, a place where um, before you make a purchasing decision, you can go and get uh, objective insight, research and analysis on different consumer products that live in and around your home, generally in the kind of 30 to $2,000 price point, but um, everything from blenders and vacuum cleaners to steam irons and riding lawnmowers. We, mm. we really address that whole um, range of, of products. And, and you started this back in November of around November of 2015. Wh where did it come from? Like what was the genesis? Had, was this something you were thinking about for years or did it come to you one day or how did this all come about? Yeah, that, it's a, it's a very interesting story. So there's three co-founders and, um, one prefers to remain anonymous, and his uh, kind of story in terms of where he found the pain point and some of the inspiration for this entire project was an effort to get a cordless drill for his workshop. And as he went through this kind of process of digging around the internet, checking different um, reviews that consumers have published, and so on and so forth, he realized that this was a whole job that some website should be doing at scale versus many, many consumers digging around on their own to find 
which cordless drill is right for them or which steam iron is right for them. And so that was one kind of pocket of, of the inspiration for my uh, second co-founder, who's our CEO. He, uh, Montreal Philov is his name, and he really saw not just the business opportunity, but he also saw that there was this huge gap of many, many goods that get returned every year from people buying things off the internet and not knowing what they're actually getting. And then I think for me, it was a combination of growing up with consumer reports and, and realizing nothing had filled that gap, being a super frugal you know, individual myself who really does research prior to making purchases and also just enjoying the uh, camaraderie and working with people like my, my other two co-founders that made the decision and the kind of whole process much easier. How... Um... How did you meet your co-founders? And, and the other part of that I was curious about is any advice you have for people who are listening who want to start a company, like how they might go about finding that co-founder? I think those are the some of the most interesting questions that I ever get asked. And I was super fortunate. I met Momchil, who is my classmate from business school, prior to business school at a social event that had been organized for admitted students. And so I happened to be here in San Francisco working at Tesla Motors at the time. He was here working for Google. That's how we met. And then he, interestingly enough, had met his, um, met our third co-founder, it had been his one of his clients when he was managing publisher accounts at Google. And so, you know, it was basically a, a, a co call, a colleague, um, kind of professional working relationship and a academic relationship. And that's how everyone came together. And so I think there was, frankly, a couple good pieces of advice I've been given in this whole process of how do you meet a co-founder? And I think one guy who summed it up really well was Matthew Prince, who's now the CEO of Cloudflare. And he said, you know, you've got to be, and I'm going to paraphrase this, you've got to be excellent to really everyone you come in contact with. And I think by never being the nasty person and by showing forth the character and integrity that you've built, and this is a perfect win for, for all veterans, you're going to be sought out eventually and sought after as a, as a co-founder because there, there's values and attributes there that people want to have in that founding circle. And so that would be kind of the, the first and maybe biggest piece of advice. But the, the following interconnected piece is to go out and, and meet people, do things, become an expert in various subjects and so forth. Because if you don't have anything to offer but integrity, it's, it's not necessarily a great fit in most cases. However, if you can say, look, I've got this integrity and character that you want around you anyway. And oh, by the way, I've got competencies in finance, accounting, um, relationships, partnership management, advertising, whatever it might be, those further skills kind of cement the way that there can be a real opportunity. Mm. And so you knew, the, the other piece that I want to dig in on that is, um, it sounds like you knew one of your co-founders for mm -hmm. multiple years, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, two or three years prior to starting the company together. Do you, do you exactly. have any advice on, if someone has identified a co-founder, any way to like kick the tires or get, you know, test that out before launching into a venture together? I think it's super hard and super important. You're touching on something that cannot be overemphasized in, in, in my opinion, Justin, and, and it's based on in of basically four or five data points where I've been involved with a project. And in most cases, those projects didn't ever actually become businesses. But I think working on projects with various founders, co-founders, small companies, startups is a great way to understand how you really function. And is there a situation where one plus one equals three for the that founding team? And fortunately for me, I was able to be involved with Best Reviews even before I joined full-time in 2015. I was involved from early 2014 onward. So I already had um, ample working experiences with both co-founders prior to the first day I stepped in as a full-time member of the team. And I think, generally speaking, that's the right 
way and path for any person and definitely any veteran because there's so much you just don't know for sure until you've worked together. And by the way, I worked for free that entire time, even though I had a day job and clearly, you know, needed to make money and it was a you know an extra commit, but it was well worth it. So I, I highly encourage thinking about how to get actual work experience with the people you, you want to found with instead of just forcing things at a place you don't understand and don't know if it's the right fit. And the other piece I would say is interconnected and equally valuable is don't just start a business to start a business. I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur and knew I wanted to be involved in this ecosystem, but I didn't have the right opportunity or passion for a project um, straight out of business school because this best reviews project had just taken off and I'd signed an offer to join LinkedIn. And so doing that little over a year at LinkedIn was a way to fulfill the obligation to LinkedIn, learn skills and work part time on this. And it, it just worked out really well for me. And that by the time I joined full time, I had more competencies, more confidence. And at the same time, I, um, you know, I was able to be super passionate and ready to roll and everything versus kind of I could have forced it earlier and it, it may not have been a successful. And I, I think that startups right now are maybe at an apex of, of popularity and public attention. And um, I think it's attractive to see all of the things that that go well, like a, an exit like the one you had. I, I'm curious if you could talk about some of the more challenging aspects of starting your own company. <sighs> The, the point, the, the fact of the matter is, Justin, it's almost, and, and you know it better than, way, way better than I do, because you have more total time as an entrepreneur than, than I do, and, and you've seen the, the ups and downs, but guess what, 90 plus percent of it, in, in my limited experience versus your own, is, is not very fun, and it's a lot of lows, a lot of emotional roller coasters, but a lot of lows, and you know, there's just never ending challenges and a never ending supply of work that doesn't even require uh, anywhere near a high school degree that has to get done. And so I think despite all the popularity and coolness and, 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 and that, oh, it's so neat to, to, to be pill pack and sell your company for a billion dollars, which, by the way, I think the world of everything they've done, it's no, um, no, in no way a put down to them, but you don't know and don't see all the work they've done behind the scenes for so many years and how probably the entire time they weren't sure if it was going to really work or not because, you know, they had a few people who could buy them and a lot of people who might not want to do that acquisition. So essentially either Amazon or Walmart comes up and buys them for a billion dollars or they might not, you know, be able to get sold for much at all. And, and maybe all that money goes to the investors and the founders make nothing. So I think there's a ton of work, a ton of very non-glorious moments, and guess what? Far more likely than not, the outcome will be equity that is worthless. Mm. And so um, I just think you have to enter it eyes wide open and realize that now that I've been involved with basically five different projects, only one really became a business, and I happen to be super fortunate in that the one that became a business also you know, resulted in a successful outcome, which both of those are normally not the case. Given, um, I mean, I, I think that's a beautiful explanation. Just given the difficulty inherent in this and the unbelievable uncertainty, how you know how did you get over that hurdle? Like, what what led you to take that leap? And also, you know, you had an incredible job at LinkedIn. What bumped you over the edge to jump off from something like that? <laughs> Yeah, Justin, I think I paid either too much attention or not close enough attention into some classes around <laughs> um, a model called Black Shoals that you might recall that <laughs> if people that want to dig in that aren't familiar, it's a model talking about how to price stock options that is very commonly used <clears throat> kind of industry standard. And the, the, the basic premise is as you increase volatility or uncertainty, you also, in, in, in most cases, increase value. Expect it. Right. Because if you go um, essentially with something super low uncertainty, which um, ironically, it might no longer be General Electric. But let's think of a really big um, CPG company. Maybe it's Procter and Gamble. Um, maybe it's Johnson and Johnson, a company that has a very smooth path or even the public sector in, in a certain bygone era where you can get a job and have a, a nearly guaranteed paycheck. And yet the chances you're going to make, you know, 
many, many millions is very low, almost zero. Whereas the, the startup opportunities and that ecosystem, to, to, in my view, and the way I've understood it is, especially if you start with something super early and have at least somewhat meaningful equity, you have the most likely out, outcome for many is gonna be zero, but you have created this possibility because of the massive volatility and uncertainty you hinted at, Justin, there's this chance, I'll, I, even if it be 1%, that you may make, you know, three, three four million dollars in, in two or three years, or $10 million in, in five years, or something that's much higher than uh, most other opportunities present to, um, to, to the kind of normal employee or normal contributor. Mm. And could you describe, um, uh, what, so you're the COO of Best Reviews. Could you kind of explain what that role is? And I know one of the things that listeners most appreciate is if you could go through uh, in as granular detail as you'd like what your day-to-day -day life looks like. It could be a representative day or today or just giving them a sense of what it's like to be in your shoes at a, as COO of a startup. Yeah, it's... I would definitely say every day has its um, idiosyncratic aspects, but um, I'm happy to just walk through a somewhat illustrative day. And I'm, I'm not going to say which day it is for for reasons of kind of protecting certain <clears throat> people and, and, and data. But uh, a non-typical day would be, or a fairly typical day would be um, Tuesday, July 10th, which was just... Um, just a few days ago, and, and I'm just going to walk through some of the calendared activities. What's non-calendared is the non-stop. Um, I get around 1,500 emails a day incoming, and then I normally send probably 200, and then I probably get 2,000 Slack messages and send maybe at 50. So there's that happening in the background. Um, but I started... My day, same way I always start it, which is with um, you know some very light exercises and so forth to kind of get the blood flowing and some whatever that routine is, which for me takes like almost an hour. So I'm basically up at um, about 6:15. Um, I'm making it in the office at like 8:30 and um, catching up on at least the most important emails that require immediate responses. And then my first meeting is at nine, and that's a um, creative art and assets review for a very large project we were preparing for. Um, as soon as I kind of unwind from that call, I have a guest arriving at our office who's a senior vice president of another company, that, um, another part of our company, ironically, that we partner with. And we have meetings scheduled with him, but he's never been at our office before. So we have to kind of give a tour and make sure he meets all the right people. He has his first meeting from 1030 to 1130. I'm in some other unscheduled meetings that have already cropped up. Those unscheduled meetings go till noon. At noon, I have a check-in with a couple of major partners. That's an hour call. As soon as that call ends, I go into meetings with the senior vice president who's been in meetings with other people. We do about an hour going through certain roadmaps, product, et cetera. Um, I then try with much difficulty to call in to um, a call that I'm supposed to be on that I've had to only be able to make a few minutes of. And then at the, as soon as that ends, I actually have another call that becomes an in-person meeting with a guy who's trying to make, raise some money for a venture shop and there's possible opportunity where his investments could be helpful to the business and so forth. As soon as he walks out of the door, I go into another meeting with that senior vice president with our whole leadership team that goes until almost four when he has to leave for the airport. And then I'm doing documentation on kind of how post-merger integration is going and catching up on several hundred emails that have come in. And that's the end of like the official work day. And then I normally go home around six-ish, try to eat some dinner, and then I'll be back trying to catch up on emails and any remaining calls probably a check-in with my uh, CEO and then call it. I try to get offline by like 8.30 and then get ready for um, get ready for bed and do it all over again. <laughs> how do you uh, 
how do you manage 1500 emails like that is just so so mind boggling so i have we have one we have one executive admin who works with us here without him uh would not be possible and he is actually a military veteran as well and he's very good at not just multitasking but handling a, just a enormously large volume of tasks and he's very good at plotting out what what I need to address versus what he can handle at his level versus what no one needs to handle. And he, he's, he's very good. Mm. So that's, uh, that's the only way I, I can handle all that. And he, he's involved with my emails, with my Slack accounts, with everything. Cause otherwise it would, it wouldn't be humanly possible. And I'm still oftentimes between like 200 and 500, 200 to a thousand emails behind is kind of the norm. That's so wild. Um, what about, there's so many listeners to the show and I know there's so many people on active duty that aspire one day to start their own company. What advice would you have for someone listening who, who's maybe on active duty and, uh, wants to eventually start their own company? I would think about finding maybe that 50, 50 balance between learning and doing, because I think that sort of balance allows you to reflect through the learning on what you're actually doing if you just and, and that's I guess if your own learning style you know is super different than that tweak it a little right maybe you're just you don't really learn as much by anything but doing well maybe you should do 80% doing 20% learning reflecting maybe it'd be books maybe it'd be online classes could be a number of different ways you, you do this but I think some blend of that's a great way to do it for me I found that to be successful I was the entire time at Harvard Business School, instead of just doing classwork and thinking that would be the solution, I was heavily engaged with startup projects and helping every startup I could get myself connected with, keeping in touch with other people working on startups. And I think that that really helped me understand a lot more of what works and what doesn't and what I got excited about versus what I didn't and even what roles, functional areas I could see myself doing versus things I didn't want to do. And I think generally that same thread will, will work for a, a lot of, of veterans. I, I love that because I, um, I think not just for entrepreneurship, for anything, it's, it's hard to uh, extrapolate what, what one will like. And it is easy if you have uh, you know, some hands-on experience, even if it's just helping, like you said, like helping out a startup for a little bit or just getting your feet wet, that's so much more valuable than reading a book or hearing someone else's experience. And so I admire the way that you just really, one, that you knew early on that that's what you wanted. And then it seems like you really threw yourself into that. And I'm, I'm imagining that meant saying no to a lot of things while you were in business school because you were making the time for the, the one thing that really mattered to you. And that was figuring out what you were going to do with entrepreneurship. Exactly. I think that sums up the, one of the most important things is no, I don't think you'll find one entrepreneur out there who didn't make sacrifices to get whatever measure of success they've gotten. Even if that success be only the fact that they were a co-founder or were a member of an early stage company that didn't work out. Guess what? You get there and you stay there through sacrifice and through basically tough, tough trade-offs. Um, I personally attended a lot of people hear about all these amazing social events and and parties and celebrations at business school. I went to a total of uh, three parties, I think, uh, or social kind of celebrations total the entire time I was there. And there's many people who did more than that in a given week. And, and you know, that's great for them. I'm not here to like point fingers and say, I made a right decision, they made a wrong decision. That's that's not what it's about. It's about trade-offs. And, and to your point, Justin, if you if you stick your head down and focus on something, which many veterans are very good at doing, you'll be, I think, pleasantly surprised with the fact that you can at the least learn a lot and grow. And, and maybe there'll be a financial reward. Maybe there won't be. That one's more difficult, I think, to predict, uh, at least in my experiences. And I know I know you shared a lot of thoughts on that, that panel that's an episode now, but um, I'm, I'm always curious your thoughts on how, the, how an MBA helped you uh, as an entrepreneur and how you would advise aspiring veteran entrepreneurs to to think about whether or not to pursue an MBA? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one, Justin. I think for me, it made all the sense in the world due to the fact that I had 
this long-term interest that I knew was going to be in business and, and, and these different areas, I had a deep passion to not just learn hands-on, but I really wanted to be in the classroom and basically rebrand and repivot, or I guess first pivot away from the military and purely into to business. And I thought to retool all the skills in the military in the most, um, I guess, comprehensive way possible, it would be in a very academically focused on business setting along with being engaged as in businesses and getting my hands dirty as an entrepreneur and trying projects, et cetera. Every person I think is different. I, I would advise the path to those who know this is what they want to do for the long term, know that they want to be in a class, even though they're going to know that not all that, that thing, all, not all the things you're going to learn in that class, you're going to need at a startup and you may not need some of them for 10 years, maybe never. But knowing them will help you understand the guy in the room from the finance team or accounting team. If you can see how it'll be helpful to you and you can be motivated to go in there and get something out of it and contribute, I think it'll be a worthwhile life investment. And I say that because you will meet likely other, a large pool of people who are like-minded and really get excited about business, see that there's something there. And being around people who are fired up about things just creates, I think, the potential for tight bonds and friendship and, and lifelong learning. I still engage and learn heavily through my peers and classmates from business school on an almost daily basis, actually daily, because <laughs> I, I work with one of them every day. And so that to me, if, if you can get there on those things, then it no longer becomes a business decision or an economic decision. It becomes a, I'm putting this money to work and leaving income on the sidelines to create um, a better version of myself and to be on a whole different life trajectory. And that's not a financial decision as much as like, what's the value of three or four A plus friends for the rest of your life? Hopefully priceless. Um, if, if you're making friends like that, that's something you'd, you don't want to be thinking of on a, on a price basis, at least not in my view. I think for those who don't want to be in an, in an academic setting, um, don't, don't like the idea of that being a component in how they get their kind of selves into the next step or pivot or rebrand. They want to do it through a company. Um, maybe there's financial constraints that make them incredibly averse to taking on any debt and that's the only way they can fund it. Well, guess what? You don't have to go. Some of my, many of my most successful mentors who are veterans, by the way, didn't um, attend business school. And so I certainly don't think it's a requirement. And yet at the same time, for, for some people, it could be incredibly beneficial and, and life-changing or even transformational. So I, I think it's kind of case by case and, you know, only one path is, is the right path for you and it may not be the right path for others. What about, because you also, you talked about after business school, it wasn't like you had the idea there or in a spot to, to jump off and start something. I, I'm curious in the same way that you view an MBA, how you viewed having that time at LinkedIn or working at a really well-established company prior to joining a startup? I, I think it's wonderful. I, I have yet to cross paths with um, many people in my entrepreneurial experiences, at least, who had effectively no prior work experience in an industry, and they're able to just come in and, and dominate. Yeah, you'll read about them, but I think for every Mark Zuckerberg who does something out of college, you're going to find literally 20, 30, 40 successful entrepreneurs who do something when they're 40 or 50 because you just know so many more things about how an industry works, trends, et cetera, et cetera. You're not stumbling into success in as many cases. And yeah, I, I'm not gonna kid myself um, at all. I, I, it's not like I became a genius by working at LinkedIn for a year and a half, but I did know a lot more about the advertising ecosystem, how you know digital um, publishing works, what are some of the pitfalls, what are some of the ways people are making money, and it, it helped me from day zero at, um, at Best Reviews in a full-time capacity, and it still helps me now. And it helps in a way that you wouldn't even think about as a veteran normally, but it's brand. And brands matter. So the fact that I worked at Tesla and LinkedIn still opens doors and gives me a level of credibility that I wouldn't have, given that my military experiences, for the vast majority, don't make any sense. They have no idea what it means that it means that I went to ranger school or went to airborne school. That, that, that doesn't correlate to anything. But guess what? 
generally speaking, if you're in the technology world, you know LinkedIn is very hard to get into, and it's a top tier brand. You know that Tesla has made these electric cars. It's super interesting. Everyone's kind of heard of it, and it's really hard to get a job there. So if you pass these two shops' wickets, that's immediate trust, credibility, and, and opportunity. Yeah, I love that. I think that it's um, you know it's there's that power of network. There's that power of um, the personal connections and what a difference that can make in business. And so your time at Tesla expands that network and time at LinkedIn does that and Harvard does that as well. And, and I just say that, you know, cause I went straight from business school to starting a company. And one of the things I'm envious of is that, um, as you spoke to earlier, when you're starting a company, there is no shortage of work, but there's also my experience is there's no shortage of things that need to be created and developed. You're, you're building, a, a company from the ground up. It's like driving 90 miles an hour down the freeway, like building the car as you're like rolling along. And one of the things I, I am envious of is, is at least having worked at Tesla and LinkedIn, you got to see how companies do some things. Maybe it's their HR, maybe it's their training, maybe it's their meeting structure. Like you're learning from extremely experienced people and great organizations um, one way of doing things. And what I fantasize about is that that takes out some of the ambiguity. It gives you some sort of role model to go off of versus, you know, coming straight from the military to business school to then starting a company. It's almost like you're, I, I was reinventing unnecessarily everything from scratch. And I think that's a, a big advantage, whether listeners go to business school or not. I think it's a big advantage to having some business experience prior to starting a company. And, you know, to your point, the number of companies that are started by people in their 40s, it's uh, there was a, a recent study about that it is a very high amount of, co of successful companies come out of people in that age. And, um, you know, I, I got out of the military at my five year point, I felt like I was just always in a rush to get to the end state. And um, I, I hope for those of you who are listening, who might be getting out on the earlier side of the military, just kind of realize you have time and you don't have to find the exact thing right away that you can take time to learn and build up concrete skills and almost treat your career as a portfolio of different skills that you can then apply to solve bigger and meatier problems once you are better informed about the intricacies of them. I, I completely agree, um, Justin. Those are just fantastic points. And another example, and maybe everyone already knows of him, maybe they don't, is a wonderful veteran entrepreneur named uh, Mark Hoffman. He is very successful in what I would call kind of Silicon Valley um, first boom, the, the 90s and the early 2000s. And he, he worked at a, uh, after business, after the army and after business school, he worked at a, at a kind of smaller tech company for several years, had formed great bonds there, ended up co-founding a startup that was sold for many, I think actually a couple billion dollars. And then from there ended up doing more things, but you know those skills, expertise, and relationships he built in his first full-time job for those first three, four years were what enabled almost everything further after in his incredibly successful technology career. So it's just another data point that kind of leads me to assume that that is a good path for many, if not all. Yeah, and I've, I've probably said it on the show before, but... Um... There's that quote from one of my favorite instructors at business school, Jill Peterson, um, had said something to the effect of you, you will make the most money in your career between ages 40 and 50. And everything is just setting yourself up so that when you're in that zone, you're just really able to crush it. And I always picture lily pads of just jumping from one lily pad to another and taking your time. Like if you're getting out and let's say you're 30, you've got 10 years after your military career to figure out what you want to do. And maybe you build up a sales skill uh, uh, skill set and maybe you build up a uh, management skill set. Maybe you build up an, an operational skill set or maybe you take five years to really get to know the broadcast industry or whatever it is. It's like building up that functional expertise and that um, industry expertise and not feeling like you have to cash it in right away. Like you're building up this career capital that then down the road you can cash in. And 
by that, maybe that's cashing it in for more autonomy and more flexibility, or maybe it's cashing it in to be able to take a risk at starting a company or, or cashing that career capital in for a higher paying job. There's so many ways to do it. But um, again, as, as Ben has pointed out, uh, the, the advice is always tainted by our own experience. But from my experience, I, I um, wish that my immediate post-military self was not in so much of a rush to try and get to get somewhere rather than um, cultivating skills along the way. Could, couldn't agree more, um, Justin. And I'd be the last to, to be able to fault you. I mean, uh, fault you for a second, because I'm certain if I had had even in close to the same amount of um, passion as I'm sure you had for, for your business and project as it was probably in its infancy, I'm sure I would have pursued it too. And um, I'm sure my outcome would have just been disastrous um, in many scenarios because um, I, I don't think I probably had the same level of you know preparations that and, and passion that, that you did so mm -hmm. that would just be one one opinion mm, thank you um, what about um, are there any resources and that could be a book or a podcast or a movie or a conference or an online program um, anything that's helped you in your civilian career and I'm especially thinking of those who are stationed overseas or on a ship or on a base and um, just something they could do today that might help prepare them for their eventual civilian career or, or for entrepreneurship in particular? Yeah, this may sound corny and, and stupid or whatever, but I, I, I'll just tell you, I think that there's for almost every, I think every single successful entrepreneur, at least that I've known on some level or another, and maybe almost every level, they're just learning machines and growth machines. And so it's to me less or so a certain book or podcast or conference as much as it is like if you're not trying to learn and better yourself every single day then maybe this isn't where you need to be entrepreneurship that is because guess what I can promise you there's a competitor out there who has more resources more time more money and they are coming at you to cut your throat all the time and so if you're not leveraging your unique skill sets which better be moving faster and moving in ways they can't predict, you're going to fail. And so I, I think you've got to use all of them. I, personally, what I enjoy, I enjoy the Wall Street Journal every single day. And I like to get the entire thing, but get as much as I can in the morning. And then um, in the evening, I like to read print. So I'm in at least two books at all times. And I have one that is almost always devoted to kind of business growth. Um, I try to watch kind of the landscape. I try to do calls with people because I've now been fortunate enough to build some relationships with people who in a 20 minute call can convey to me probably what would take me 10 hours to research on the Internet. But I think you have to use every single tool you can get to. And when you find out the ones that work best for you, maybe it's a certain podcast or conference. You get a ton out of it. You're able to retain a lot. Just keep pouring it on, because if you become a learning machine, to, to, to Justin's earlier point, you're going to accumulate what I would call so much knowledge capital that it's just a matter of time before you trade in those chips for financial capital. Mm. I love that, man. I think that's such great advice. Um, I'll, I'll put in the show notes for listeners. Uh, it, he, uh, what Ben just said made me think of episode 99. I interviewed Jacob Martinez, who went from being an army sergeant to president of uh, the United States 592nd fastest growing company. So incredible success story. But um, just like Ben described, he was just a learning machine. He was always reading another book or going to another conference. Like he was always sucking in information. And I think that um, I, I love that quote, success leaves clues. And like Ben said, you know, you can learn from 10 minutes with someone. It can save you hundreds of hours and you know you can read these books or these stories and I love um, also reading these biographies of, of people who have accomplished incredible things it's a way of getting in their head and seeing how they think and how they approach things and learning about the struggles that they face but I, I think that that's um, one of the best answers I've heard for that question Ben is, is just that thought of it isn't about it's like the, the book or podcast or conference it's just a single drop of, of water on a waterfall it's just that it's more about the uh, the commitment to continuing to grow, to continuing to challenge oneself, 
And if you do that, you're going to find the answers you need. You're going to be equipped with the knowledge that you need because you're just always bringing in new information and mulling that over and applying it and then moving on. I think that was fantastic. Thanks, Justin. Well, I, um, I always like to keep the last question open-ended, and that's that you know, you've answered a lot of questions for me and given a lot of great advice. I'm sure there's things that I have not asked about that you want to make sure listeners know. So I'd love to just turn it over to you to, to, to share anything else that you want to make sure you impart to listeners before we wrap up. Yeah, it's, it's really just a two-pronged tent, and you know, hopefully this is helpful to a lot of people because these are things that I think have been most helpful to me. The first one would be to be resilient. I know it's something we used to talk about a lot in the military circles, and it really doesn't matter what path you choose after the military or, or how um, prepared you are, there are gonna be incredible setbacks, I can almost assure you. And I'm, I'm sure you know we, we've all seen those, and unfortunately, I've, Justin's probably seen them just almost as many as I have or, or more. Build the resilience and um, remember the successes you've had and it's, it's a skill set that the military does a really good job of training and you can't, I don't think you can have too much of it. You're gonna end up needing every last drop and then reflect on it. And I, for me, writing has been a useful way to reflect, but, but reflect on it now, reflect on what you've learned because the, the, the biggest travesty I think I see in the, the veteran community is people who kind of rush through their service and then getting out of the service, they never reflected much on what they did in the service or how that might apply post-service and as a result, their civilian careers are either not the move they should have made, they, they should have just stayed in the military longer, or they, they didn't really transfer the skill sets. They had these awesome skills in the military that they've never honed into civilian settings. So simple writing would have allowed them to probably understand, hey, I really feel comfortable in leading people in this way or managing people that way and communicating like this or scheduling things like this, whatever it might be, the more I've reflected and I, you know, having gone through this process of selling a company, I did like a, a several hundred, several hundred pages of documentation, which I've now found I've learned so much more about why it worked, what about it worked, what didn't work. And I've been able to share that with people who it's helped them a ton. That's neat, but it's also just helped me grow. And it's kind of back to the growth machine point. You, you, you won't be a growth machine if everything comes in one ear and out the other. So take the time writing, reading, uh, maybe it's speaking it into a phone, whatever it works for you to reflect on it. Take that time because I think you'll get so much more learning out of it. I love that. I love that sense of, of reflection. Is there anything in particular that's helped you with writing? Is Do you do like morning pages or do you just kind of every couple months journal or what's helped you set that time aside to actually use writing to reflect? It's a grind. I, I found just the only way I can do it is to actually put it on my calendar. Yeah. So I'll calendar off 30 minutes at least a couple times a week that I'm going to work on that project. And then I just don't let it get overwritten. And um, for me, at business school, I was able to do it every day. Post business school, it's been sporadic, but I've still consistently been cranking out good, a good quantity of content that's not A plus in quality, but at some point I'm going to go back and probably make it better if I, if I publish any of it. And yet it's still super helpful to people who find themselves in that exact same situation. I think it helps me remember things better. I even do a, an article and you, t you touched on this kind of the books podcast conference. Don't go to that stuff and then just walk away. I write a review of every single book I read at least one page. Just what are the key points? What did you get out of this? And I think that process and forcing function can really create value that's great man it's like um that that old phrase that like the best way to learn something is to teach it to others and even if even if you don't publish it it's i imagine it helps it stick in your mind more when you take the time to process it and write it down and then you know maybe one step up from that it's something you can reference down the road to jog your memory but potentially that's something that you can publish or share with others and get even more use from it that's such a, a great strategy well, hopefully, it's, uh, hopefully it'll help people. I, I feel like it's helped me and everyone I've recommended it to and who's tried it, it's helped them as well. So g given those data points, I feel like it's something I feel comfortable kind of sharing with a wider, wider audience. Mm. Well, Ben, I appreciate, especially given uh, the, the great explanation you gave of your role and your day-to-day. -day. I, I know how busy you are, how, how flooded you are with, with different requests for your time. So I appreciate your taking the time to speak with me and the Beyond the Inform audience and appreciate the example you are of a veteran succeeding in entrepreneurship. So thanks for joining me today. 
Thank you for having me, Justin. It's a wonderful program and initiative that you've, again, given your entrepreneurial spirit, kind of picked up from nothing and made into something really special. And I hope that it's helpful to you know, the, the entire audience and, and any others who it can benefit. Surface, surface, surface. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Ben. If you're liking the show, I would greatly appreciate it if you share a positive review on iTunes. And better yet, tell your friends and shipmates, service members, uh, anyone who you've served with, if they could benefit from this. Uh, Beyond the Uniform is produced and edited by me, Justin Asiri. Our editor is Kathleen Dillon. Our director of outreach is Steve Bain. Our data analytics and insights advisor is Andrew Woolridge. We'll be back, we will be back next week with more interviews with military veterans about their civilian career. Have a great day.